S.J. Fowler is a writer, poet and artist who lives in London. His work has been commissioned by Tate Modern, BBC Radio and the Science Museum, amongst others. Steve's work has been translated into 27 languages and he has produced collaborations with over 150 artists. He's published eight collections of poetry, five of artworks, six of collaborative poetry, plus volumes of selected essays and selected collaborations. His most recent book is Sticker Poems, published by Trick House Press, with 99 full-color poems made of actual stickers. His writing has explored subjects as diverse as prescription drugs, films, fight sports, museums, prisons, and animals. Steve, thank you so much for joining us today. It's such an honor to have you speaking with the Oxford Review of Books and sharing some of your particular experiences with the landscape in the city, as well as your thoughts about the life of animals in our increasingly human world. So, and I'd love to start off by asking you a bit more about that residency that you did. A cemetery is a really fascinating place to be spending time as a poet and exploring what's in the ground under your feet, what's above you as you stand there. And I just love to hear a bit more about how it came about and what you discovered while doing that. Thank you, Sally. It's lovely to talk with you. I have huge respect for your work and for your research. So it's a real privilege for me to chat with you about these things. And thank you for reading my bio. It, it reminds me of once I uh, was doing a reading in London and the host asked me, have you got a bio? And I lazily just sent the link. <laughs> and so I stood up as they said, I'm reading. And then they read my entire bio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was stood in front of the whole audience, slowly drooping into the floor like an egotistical fool. So you, you, you clipped it very well, but I did feel a bit foolish there. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, the residency was something that happened very organically. And I was living mm -hmm. very close to this magnificent place, Kensal Green Cemetery, that has been with Wormwood Scrubs, both in industrial West London, near Wilston Junction and Labrick Grove, a real centrifugal force in my life over the last 15 years it, it, it they are the two spaces i would like my my ashes to be scattered they are the first places really in my life that i considered home in the way that one might ambiguously connect with that word <clears throat> so i've been going to the cemetery for many years because it is this soft sweet spot in the magnificent seven the famous victorian beautifully designed cemeteries in london which is overgrown but also appreciated it's neither allowed to go rewilded like tower hamlets nor is it carefully curated like say highgate and so people know of it but they don't they know that harold pinter's there ballard's there you know some great writers a lot of you know historical figures are there brunel and people like that but um they don't really visit it unless they live in the area i was living in the area and I was running through it a lot. And then through a friend, my collaborator, Teresa Stelikova, got to meet some of the people who were using the refurbished Dissenters Chapel to do art exhibitions and events. And building that relationship then over the summer of 2017, mm. we had a residency there. And, and during that summer, I went almost every day and I made paintings and poems, visual poems from the materials of the cemetery, the things that were binned or discarded, the mud, you know, and this, this sense of unbelievable atmosphere, but also forgotten history. You know, so many of the graves are from empire heroes or, you know, one, on one patch you'll see, you know, a, a, a gravestone that says the first DJ in West London and a huge, you know, beautiful fresh bouquet. And then a Sir James hero mm -hmm. of, so it's this incredible layering of history and that which is forgotten and also materials because you know what's beneath your feet. Yeah. And the way that the cemetery separated, it, it's extraordinary. So it's a microcosm of the best of London, you know, nature geography, shall we say, the way that the city overwhelms spaces. It's very special. Sounds fantastic. It makes me desperate to want to go there myself. I mean, one question is what you make of less explicit oases in the city. So, of course, there are these places that just bring together trees and silence and birdsong in a way that can be really engaging. And there's also the encounters with nature when you've just got a little line of moss between two paving stones that you notice as you're waiting for the bus. Or I'm curious about the other places in which nature maybe intersects with your experience of the city on a daily basis. 
Yeah, I thought about this a lot because I tend to, in the same way that I, <clears throat> my frenetic energy and my lack of ability to be editorial in my poetry requires me to build genuine friendships and collaborations around those things that I'm not good at. So I have spent a great deal of time walking around the city and very specifically not writing about that. Yeah. I was very influenced and very supported early on by writers like Ian Sinclair and, and, and other really important um, writers of London, but not being from London and realizing how special it was working as an artist and a teacher and a poet, a freelancer, having the time to walk, that I didn't write about that, that I didn't touch upon it in my poetry or in prose because it was so almost sacred to me. But having this hyper energy, I don't really sit in oasis and, and meditate. I don't really see those miniatures, those beautiful emergent nature properties until I'm with other people like Teresa or like dear friends that I walk 10, 15, 20 miles across the city with mm. or, or with um, the landscape architects, um, Neil Davidson and Joe Gibbons, who I've been in residence with for many years, which I think we might mention. And they see that they have that focus, they have that ability to bracket out space, which is not made for contemplation. Mm -hmm. And I don't, so I, I terraform, I just, I cover huge distances. I have music on, <laughs> I'm moving through these spaces. And so it's through other people or through accidents or exhaustion, which seems to me like a paradox, which is profitable in terms of city. You know, I, I, would, I am one of these people who would go mad in real nature. And so therefore I am perhaps m most, genetically, physically, psychologically suited for a city like London and the oasis it gives. It's fantastic then to imagine you, as you're saying, intersecting with these landscape architects who have that particular vision and much as you're creating form and order with the way you're working with words on the page are sculpting the spaces, the little pocket gardens, presumably and terraces and other small interfaces with which people are connecting with nature in the city and be really curious to hear a bit more about the ways in which you collaborated with them and the sorts of areas of focus your your work has taken thus far. Thank you yeah they've been great friends and that residency has been really a, a story of friendship and for me learning and that's how I do see collaboration and I don't mean that glibly or modestly or lightly I mean literally I see collaboration as a pedagogy you know I I I'm able to get access to things through these connections, which other people wouldn't. And what, and what I've learned from <clears throat> the team at JNL Gibbons, Joe and Neil, and the other, the other brilliant people there, is just how to be actually pragmatically good in the improvement of urban environments. I mean, they actually do the work. Mm -hmm. They don't write nonfiction, best-selling books about it. They don't talk about rewilding. Mm -hmm. They don't, they actually are in front of developers they actually are in front of the mayor. They actually have done dozens and dozens of projects which have improved the city. And, and it's affected my poetry because when you're a poet in residence with a group of people who are incredibly down to earth, funny, humble, share things with you, an avant-garde poet or whatever people would call me, a weird poet, what possibly can I bring? And, and I really embrace that because all I can bring is a sensitivity to language. Mm -hmm. So what they have forced me to realize is that my concerns in writing about nature or engaging with nature through poetry are about the way in which humans use the language of nature. There is a barrier between what we say and what we think around what nature is as a concept. And without going into epistemology and philosophy, I mean, in a literal way, it's very easy for people to talk about nature. It's a, it's a very different thing for them to create a lifestyle or to have a, a way of living and being which actually engages with these ideas underneath the word surfaces, which is the primary concern of poetry to me, worrying about what language is actually doing between human beings and not assuming that words have these fixed insightful meanings that, that don't shift and so forth. And I think nature is one of the most important areas of this. We've, we've lost the thread a lot of times. We, we've fallen in even to positive language of nature. Mm -hmm. uh, it does this, it's good for us. And all these ideas, as though nature doesn't want to kill humans yeah. all the time, as though nature is not also terrifying and awful, you know, all these things of language and, and in poetry and nonfiction writing, especially, 
you know, that's happened. There's been like a, a shine. So working with JNL Gibbons, I see what it actually looks like when someone says we need to plant more trees in London. Well, we can all say that Joe Gibbons and Neil Davidson have actually planted hundreds of new trees and told hundreds of people with power to do it and have made it happen. And that is so amazing for me as someone whose profession has no pragmatic purpose. And that's what I want. I don't want pragmatic purpose. So it's a, it's a great, great uh, connection for me. Well, sort of speaking about the ways that poems are interfaces between people and are capturing or not capturing these ideas, I wonder if you might share one or two poems with us. So it would be lovely to hear any work that maybe is sparked off what we've been talking about so far. Sure, that's very kind of you to ask. I do think it's always a bit strange reading on Zoom, but for you, Siley, and, and for the people of Oxford, it would be a joy. So I'll just read a poem from this book I wrote, which came out in 2017 with Shearsman Press called The Guide to Being Bear Aware, which is the second in a kind of trilogy um, that I've done that is about, about what I was saying, the Anthropocene and the way humans use language to describe nature and animals um, and, and what actually that language is doing away from the reality of these things that, set, that exist away from humans' perception, which almost no one talks about. Um, I just randomly opened the page to page 45 to a poem called Landowner. Uh, and there is a, an epigraph by Carlos Oquendo de Amat. The child thinks the zebra is an animal. The zebra is a vegetable soap. Not my words. Good lines, Carlos. Landowner. My moods aren't seasonal. I keep horses and they're affected by emotions. At times they are left to tend to their own stabling as I'm imprisoned for a stabbing. This is because I've chosen to fight, whether to impress a mate or define my property. There are boundaries, lines in the field that may not be crossed. My insignia is a winged horse starting on a unicorn. My house is a source of wealth. The bricks are possessed. That is the end of the poem, Landowner. Thank you, Siley. Beautiful um, poem. Thank you. I, I think it's the first time I've ever read it out loud. Um, all right, I'll do one other quick one. This is called Pact. Each muscular dream of each muscular body increases the fear and shortens the lead on the lease of life. Camp blueprints show 17 huts built on the downward southern slope of the rubbish tip near Clichy sur Seine. Their children are so beautiful. Is it wrong to dream of them before they're cleared? There's dogs to rely on, songs to smother. Let's be having you. Thank you so much for lifting the Zoom poetry reading. <laughs> My pleasure. No, it was lovely to read them. I haven't read them for a few years. Thanks for asking. No, they're gorgeous. How did the collection come into being? What got you writing about bears and inhabiting bears? Um, well, I have a, the bear is kind of my animus, an obsession of mine, um, because, um, yeah, I one of one of the names that uh, is, it is in my family history is is the is the Scandinavian name for bear. So um, so bears have always been my animal, my go to animal. I'm fascinated by them and what they represent. Without going into it, you know, historically a lot of cultures saw bears as as people. You know, grandfather animals that can stand on their hind legs, and I, I find them to be a very useful, ironic, comic but serious avatar for the way in which we anthropomorphize animals constantly especially in praise of them now um the way we treat dogs as though they're children and so forth and so on that's so prevalent and there's very little concern for it because criticizing that makes you look like a curmudgeon um, and obviously i don't really because i do it through poetry which the whole point is that i don't want to be direct so i wrote a book in 2014 called the rottweiler's guide to the dog owner and then followed that in 2017 with the guide to being bear aware and then i finished a book recently that'll be coming out i think next year called the great apes and essentially all of these books are utilizing the figures and avatars of the way that we describe certain animals to have characteristics that they clearly don't have 
that ironically reveal our human characteristics to ourselves without most people really acknowledging that. Um, and that would be dogs, bears and apes. Um, so it grew, grew from those concepts. And then obviously within the actual structure of the collections, it, it goes into different places around these metaphors that we use for animals. And, and hopefully a lot of the time that's lost on the people reading them. That's my mm -hmm. desire. I, I like the idea of my poetics being a, an inside joke or so elusive that, that it's not really understood unless I describe it or explain it like I've just done now, which I normally don't do. Absolutely. I mean, what, what do you make about that sort of habit of anthropomorphizing all the creatures around us? Is it something that you feel has a positive use or is it? Yeah. I, I think there's, without being massively generalized or silly, I think there's a series of... Um, there's a series of titanic intellectual struggles which are not finished that people mm. think are finished because the zeitgeist has moved on and one of them would be the problems or the intricacies of say psychoanalysis a lot of people not that i am a psychoanalyst i'm quite suspicious about psychoanalysis which we all should be and we're not um but ideas around say projection or ideas around you know these i these concepts are not they're not finished. We're not past them. All of us are at risk of doing this all the time. All of us are blind to ourselves, me more than most. But I do think a lot of the time, without being rude, there is a sense of humans, humans being so arrogant because of self-awareness, because of cognition and, and uh, consciousness, that even when humans are trying to be sweet and that their hearts mean well, which is better than the opposite, there is a pernicious lack of humility in front of living creatures so that even when people do wish to preserve these creatures they do so on incredibly human terms mm -hmm. by taking nature and animals as though they're moral creatures as though morality exists in a way because especially now everything needs to be very moral or in a moral code mm -hmm. as though that's new as though we know more than every human that existed before although we can dictate to animals i mean you literally see a video where a certain animal's appearance will gain it more character and morality than others, even when the people doing that are supposedly in support of animals and so forth. So incredibly complex, but the point for me is that I'm not an intellectual or philosopher who criticizes or talks about that, but that's juicy material for poetry because the subtleties and ironies of the way that we project onto other things in the world, dogs or bears or apes, it's full of language. It's full of incredibly funny and subtle and weird language. The way we look at internet culture now with the way that dogs have become these little words that people are around, booping and all these amazing things. That's all, that's all gorgeous material, I think. So that's, that's why I'm concerned with it. Mm, fantastic. Well, on that note, would you like to finish with a poem or two talking of the wonders of language that are associated with? Oh, sure. Yeah, that would be a pleasure. Um, I'll perhaps grab one more and, um, and, and close our beautiful quick conversation. Sorry, I waffled. That tends to be in my way. Um, thank you. Um, so this is called The Cat Lover's Disco, and it has an epigraph by Sean Bonney. This is the epigraph. Got a lovely pussy cat and gonna and gonna feed him his whiskers. The Cat Lover's Disco. You're sad and you know you are. Women who don't like working with women admit to me they don't like women. This is uncomfortable. It's not my fault the girl is not a standard but a nighttime bus driver endlessly lapping suburbs, just like me. One can travel the world yet to see those beaches again. It's like one has never left the shore. A bear in Canada tongue licks for blood, like skin off with sweat imprints that hang in puddles on the backs of its food. Or if you like, victims. Bend does a pussy leg when landing from on high. Angels piss into the mouth of the sensitive, purring and falling. I'm sorry about that. Wishing it wasn't so acidic like vinegar, the only thing that'll clean up the rash that's spreading from your belly button to your knees. You'll have to give the cat back. You're allergic. 
Thank you so much, Steve, for being here. Thanks so much, Sally. It's a pleasure.